Professor Robbie Sable, thank you so much for being my guest. Um, you were a professor of mine at Hebrew University while I was doing my LLM, my master's in law, and I credit you with giving me a foundation of public international law. Your classes have carried through until today with my understanding of uh, international law and uh, the issues surrounding Israel, Palestine, Hamas, all those complicated issues which I'm looking forward to discussing with you. Um, as an initial um, starting point, if you will, you had an incredible career as a lawyer for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I'd like you to touch upon that. But before you get there, you open your mouth, you hear you have a British accent and you're an Israeli lawyer. If you can just talk us through how you landed up in Israel and why, when did that come about? Well, I've been trying to get rid of the English accent for many, many years. I arrived in Israel at age seven, but apparently since I spoke English with my parents at home, I, I didn't manage to get rid of the accent. So my children say I speak Hebrew with an English accent and an Englishman will say I speak English with a Hebrew accent. So worst of both worlds. Fair enough. Okay, so you came here as a kid and you grew up in Israel. I grew up in Israel. I, I did study, I studied in England as well, which may account for some of the English. Yeah. And I did my law degree in the Hebrew University, did army service. I was in the regular army for a bit and uh, practiced law as a private lawyer. I don't think I was as successful as you appear to be, but I was a private lawyer for two years. And then I got the bug of foreign relations and served nearly 30 years in the foreign ministry. Well, so how was that process? You got in as a young lawyer and, and what kind of work did they throw at you? Tell me about your 30 years, if you can sum it up. I started off in what is called the claims department, dealing with real, real legal issues. Uh, workers who fell down and, and sued the office and, and uh, that's uh, wills and so on. Mm -hmm. Then I went into more uh, international law and was deputy legal advisor. I served as the political counsel to the embassy in Washington, which was a fascinating period through the Reagan administration. And then I came back and was legal advisor for nearly nine years, for nearly 10 years. Wow. So what, what kind of uh, issues come across your table as a legal advisor to the foreign ministry? And uh, what is the role of a legal advisor, if you will, in such a position? A legal advisor has a strange position because he has to give legal advice and it's got to be absolutely uh, straight, correct. In other words, foreign, foreign ministers, in my experience, don't like to be told they can't do things. And they was, but a legal advisor must say, look, if you do such and such a thing, it'll be regarded by the world community as illegal. And foreign ministers want to hear, no, no, tell me why it's legal. And you can't do it. You've got to, it's very tempting to, to tell a minister an opinion that he wants to hear. But it'll, it won't, in the long run, he, he won't pay off because even if he hears from you that it's a wonderful position, you can do it. The moment he goes abroad and hears from other friendly governments that it's illegal, he'll be angry with you. So you have to give them the unvarnished legal opinion. I think, I mean, this is true even when you meet with a client, isn't it? You've got to tell, you, you've got to tell him at first, what are your chances? What is the law? Then you act as his, as his uh, advocate. Beforehand, you must give a legal, uh, unvarnished legal opinion. And uh, legal advisors are often not popular. Because they say, yes, but, right. and uh, I remember many times uh, the foreign minister would come to me and say, look, I've reached an agreement with uh, some other minister uh, from a different country. It's okay. And I would say, I didn't want to tell him that uh, in, in a year's time or two years time, he may no longer be the foreign minister. And the only thing that will be left will be the paper in the cold uh, light of dawn, the only thing you look at is the actual agreement and not the wonderful atmosphere and the fact that he drank whiskey with the Egyptian foreign minister is irrelevant. So you have to try and persuade your ministers it's important what is actually written down and not the wonderful atmosphere that you had. Right. So, so what years were you there? You say you were there for an odd 30 years. What, what time period did you go through? What were the main issues that you had to deal with, whether it be peace negotiations or uh, foreign, foreign relations matters? Is there anything that you can talk to? I know a lot is confidential possibly, but uh, any insights and stories you can share? Uh, a legal advisor to the foreign ministry is a jack of all trades. 
yeah. you've got to be to be, be knowledgeable about the laws of war and uh, maritime law and aviation law and you're expected to know the answer all the time i remember being called up one time i think it was three o'clock in the morning and being told that we knew that there was a terrorist a dangerous terrorist on board a i think a scan Scandinavian ship in the Mediterranean on the high seas and the Israeli Navy wanted to know can we go and intercept him you have to give a real answer and they're not they're not interested in uh, where I got the information from or what Professor Lauterbach wrote they want to know is it legal if not what would be the consequences of doing it and you have to get an answer in real time it's uh, it's it's tough right absolutely I, I spoke to um Daniel Reisner about a month or so ago, and he left me with this message that he was very uh, disillusioned. And I, I'm not sure if that's the word he used, but something like that with international law, because it could be used as a, a sword and not a shield, and uh, it, it may have been perverted in recent years. What's your take overall on uh, the field, public international law? What's, what's your feeling, if you will, about it? Um. International law is important. It's irrelevant. It's relevant, brother, yeah. uh, in different, different, different forms. By the way, when I say you're consulted, sometimes I wasn't consulted. I remember one particular incident. I was called in in 1976, called into the office of the Director General at small hours of the morning, and with some other colleagues, and told to close the door and I'm not allowed to use the telephone. Then, when the doors were closed and we, we probably started to use the telephone, he told us that there was an operation on way to rescue Israelis who had been kidnapped and hijacked to Antebi. I don't know whether you remember the incident. Of course, Yoni Netanyahu. Exactly. And I, he, the director, director General turned to me and says, Robbie, you prepare now a legal argument why it's legal. You didn't, I wasn't asked before. And he turned to my other colleagues at the head of the African desk, prepare a note to the African states that were not offending, and to the UN and so on. We all sat there. I remember about two hours later, he said, OK, they're on the way back. You can now tell your family. And I phoned up the family and told them wow. uh, the exciting news. So sometimes you're not consulted in advance, but often you are. Once, you are, once the government has taken the action, you then change your hat. You become the advocate for the government even if they acted against your advice, which is, again, but you know this as a lawyer. I think all lawyers know it. Mm -hmm. Tell your client, don't do it. If he does it, he's still entitled to be represented. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got to warn him not to do something illegal, but if he does it, he's entitled to have his law. Same is true of, the, of, a, of a government and the Israeli government. So many times I would give my opinion, we should do something to do. The moment the government decided to do it, it was my job to present the legal defense. And here international law plays a role because the moment something is seen to be illegal, you've lost international support. Even friendly governments won't support Israel on an issue which they seem to be illegal. To give a current example, the settlement issue. I think Israel has very strong arguments that the settlements are legal and is not a war crime. To be honest, we've lost the PR battle on this. Except for the United States, no state supports us on this issue. It's, uh, it means it gives a tremendous uh, advantage to the other side when we'll have to negotiate, when we'll have to negotiate the issue of settlements in the West Bank and Judea and Samaria, they can start by saying it's illegal, nothing to talk about. So it's awfully important to make a point that what you're doing is legal. Uh, it doesn't mean you'll get support. The reverse is true. The moment you manage to brand something as illegal, You've, you've, lost, you've lost the battle, and we, Israel needs international support, but they all states do. I remember when the United States was, did something that was illegal on the, on the way it treated Taliban prisoners of war, and torturing and so on, clearly illegal. The moment the allies of the United States, the closest allies, felt that the United States was doing something illegal, they lost support. You may recall that Germany and Italy and Great Britain, the closest allies, refused to cooperate in what they call, I think, uh, euphemistically extraordinary rendition that was flying people to be tortured in other countries. By the way, they didn't send them to Israel. They knew Israel would not do it. 
they were close to that. They sent them to other countries, our neighbors, not to Israel. So the moment you lose support, the, most, the moment you've got something is, is branded as illegal, you're in trouble. It's awfully important to put the case in terms of international law. It sounds like it's quasi-political even. Uh, public opinion, PR, there's so much that goes into uh, international law that you need the other pieces working with you, the PR machine and you know, other such uh, public support to support your position because it could go either way. It's, a, it's, a, it's an argument that could be used and abused international law and that's kind of what we've seen. You're absolutely right. However, the language is that of international law. It, an, it must be, it, only in international law can we use the language of, let's say, take, go back to the settlement issue. Is it a violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention, etc.? No, you've got to use the legal, legal language. Yeah. Because every foreign minister of every country will consult his legal advisor and say, is this legal? <laughs> and you may have the most wonderful arguments, but if the whole world thinks you're wrong, you're in trouble. Right. Yeah, the settlements is a good example of uh, how the public opinion is against Israel. And I mean, now what's going on with the whole Hamas-Israel uh, conflagration, it's, uh, you know, the, the rockets going back and forth, people frame it as the Israel-Palestinian conflict. And uh, I know after having lived there that there's uh, separate issues, Israel-Palestine and Israel and Hamas. And they're uh, different legal regimes that apply perhaps and different issues on the table. So, um, I, I mean, maybe let's put the Israel-Palestinian legal issues aside and focus on Israel-Hamas because that's more contemporary right now. It's what's going on for the most part. And if you can start just by legally differentiating Hamas and the Palestinians, if you could do such a thing, and then we can go talk about more about Hamas. I think the major issue here, what are the laws of war that apply? And Israel has taken, I think, a very uh, principled position that whenever we're in an armed conflict, irrelevant with whom, the Israeli forces are subject to the laws of war, of international armed mm -hmm. conflict. We don't, we don't do any quibbling as, oh, well, it's, it's a eternal war, it's the guerrillas. The Israeli army must abide by the laws of war. The problem is that some of the laws of war seem to have been warped against Israel. In other words, Laws of war have been invented that apply only to Israel. For instance, proportionality. You hear a lot about proportionality, and it's a, there is a rule of war which we comply with that you must not cause disproportionate civilian casualties. In other words, in any case where you attack a military target, you must take into account what are the foreseeable civilian uh, casualties. And if there are an ex excess of the military advantage, you shouldn't do it. And this is what this is Israel does. It's the decision of the commanders, not a legal decision. Otherwise, the legal advisor will say, look, you, commander, must decide. And it's very difficult. For instance, if you have a rocket uh, next to a school, the commander must take into account, look, has that rocket been fired? If it's been fired already, the military advantage of taking out the uh, the team is not. If it's about to be fired, there's a very high military advantage in knocking it out. If it's going to be fired at your civilians or even at your soldiers, you've got to take into account the possible casualties that you will have. Then, how many civilians are there? If there's one civilian next to a military target, if there's a lot, and all this has to be weighed by the military commander in real time, often under fire. And the other side doesn't care a damn about it. They're aiming deliberately at civilian targets and putting their rockets deliberately next to their own civilians. For them, it's a win-win situation. If we don't attack them, they've got away with it. If we attack them and we cause civilian casualties, they immediately CNN and the whole world will say, look, civilian casualties have been caused. Uh, uh, the Israeli, former president of the Israeli Supreme Court said, an, an army in a democracy fights a war with its arm. Uh, one arm tied behind his back, and he's correct. But thank God we are in a democracy, and our military commanders must and do take into account every time what are the foreseeable civilian casualties. But when I say international law has been warped, they've raised the, uh, the claim that Israel uses disproportionate force. Now, it sounds bad, but the, uh, the, the reality is that in every military conflict, you want to use more force than the enemy. 
There's no rule which says if the enemy fires at you with a, with a rifle, you can only shoot back with a rifle. Clearly, every military commander will like to bring more force, better weapons against the, the enemy. So there's no rule of disproportionate force, but this has been invented for Israel. You may have read that Israel used disproportionate force. Imagine uh, accusing the uh, Allied armies in the Second World War of using disproportionate force against the German army. They, they were being laughed out of court. Of course you use. You want to be more tanks against the enemy. But for Israel, we, it's disproportionate use of disproportionate force. By the way, another thing that annoys me is civilian casualties. If civilian casualties are caused deliberately, it can be war crime. Or even if they're caused negligently. But civilian casualties, civilian casualties as such are not proof of a war crime. And uh, again, going back to the Second World War, I read that in, in D-Day, when uh, American, British and Canadian troops landed on, on, the, on the beaches of Normandy, during the first day of killing, uh, the first day of fighting, 40,000 French civilians were killed. French civilians, clearly not deliberate. This is a war crime. It's a horrible result of war. We, Israel makes every effort, more, more effort than any, I think any other state has ever done to avoid civilian casualties, both for moral reasons and, to be honest, also for practical reasons. Uh, civilian casualties is a bonus for the other side. They show this to the world. It's not on our interest to cause civilian casualties. Therefore, we've taken steps that I don't think any other army has. We drop dummy bombs on a building before we bomb it. We send them uh, SMS messages. Get out. We can't always do this. If it's a moving target, you've got to hit him while he's moving. But if it's a building, we can do it. And of course, it causes us a loss of surprise. It means the enemy can run away from the building, which they do. You've seen this in the recent things. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we're trying to avoid civilian, civilian casualties. But nevertheless, the moment there's civilian casualties, Israel is accused of being a war crime, committing war crimes. So uh, if we're slightly paranoid, <laughs> There's some good reason for it. Right. Understandably. I mean, I've, I've uh, interpreted that word proportionality as a bit of a curse word because how do you compare apples and oranges, Israel and Hamas, terrorist organization versus democracy? You know, is there a way to uh, properly apply the concepts of proportionality to the Israel-Hamas situation where it's just so different? You know, what is the correct application of proportionality? The correct uh, application is civilian casualties, or expected civilian casualties, as against the military advantage. Mm -hmm. And this is the commander must, and it's, it's a rule of law which we don't argue with and we apply, I think, more than other states. Mm -hmm. You have to, when you're attacking a military target, you say, look, there's civilians next to it. Uh, to give an extreme example, if you have a military headquarters and there's one civilian there, clearly it's proportional, civilian mm -hmm. casualties. If you have a, a, a civilian vegetable market guarded by a soldier, you can't attack that soldier because the, the harm to the civilians will be disproportionate. But life is not that clear. It's always much more difficult. Right. Because you don't, you don't have real information, real time. You can't, nobody, no army has perfect information. Civilians can suddenly move in. Or the civilians in the house, we don't know that they're there. Mm -hmm. uh, or what we think is, is a small target tends out to be a rocket, uh, a barrage of rockets about to be fired at an Israeli town. It's vital for the military commander to take those rockets out. By the way, during the previous fighting in Gaza, we found that the Hamas had put a military headquarters underneath the hospital. Mm -hmm. And we decided, I think correctly, not to attack it. And they got away with it. So again, we are fighting, all democracies fight with one hand tied behind their back. So be it. I don't want to live in a society that's not democratic. Right. I mean, there's so many issues that arise based on the circumstances there. Can you talk about also the combatant, non-combatant distinction and how blurred that is in, in Gaza without formal combatants, if you will, or how do you even make that distinction? The wall is, and by the way, most international law uh, is common sense, uh, is that enemy combatants are legitimate targets. So are civilians who take an active part in hostilities. In other words, the civilian who's acting, uh, who's obviously firing at you, but is gathering intelligence is a legitimate target. 
this makes it, the problem in Hamas is none of them wear uniforms. How do we distinguish between legitimate targets? So we have certain rules of thumb. Children are never legitimate targets, whatever they're doing. Uh, and we assume that and if we warn people and they don't run away and they're again firing at us, they are combatants. But it's very difficult to decide. And of course, they take advantage of this. They've used hospitals, uh, sorry, they've used ambulances to convey rockets. What do we do? Do we take every ambulance? We don't know what's inside an ambulance. Or do we let them happily move their rockets inside ambulances? And they don't give a damn. I mean, talking about Hamas and international law is irrelevant. It's like talking about uh, uh, Qaeda, Al Qaeda, and uh, international law. They don't consult it. Yeah, that, that's why, um, I mean, a bit of on a different note is the ICC probe into Israel's actions in Gaza, which makes it almost humorous. And obviously, I'm very against it, and the Israeli position is very against it because. Again, apples and oranges, how do you judge one side when they're fighting against terrorists, for lack of a better term? Um, I mean, what's your take on that whole international law, trying to judge, you know, ultimately a, a conflict which is just so complicated? Here again, they've applied a special international law to Israel. Uh, I know it sounds paranoid, but we are slightly paranoid. Every other country that investigates its war crimes, that's the end of it. The ICC doesn't intervene. Only with Israel. Because if, by the way, when you're fighting a war, you're liable to get soldiers who violate the laws of war. That happens in any, in any. But every democratic country prosecutes the soldiers. Canada does, Israel does, uh, United States, UK, Germany, they we'll do it. Why? Because it's, a, it's in our interest for our soldiers to comply with the laws of war. We don't want them uh, committing uh, war crimes. And we've investigated every case where it was claimed that the Israeli soldiers fired civilians unnecessarily. In every other country, this satisfies the ICC. Here not. We're not satisfied with the Israeli investigation. And the other issue they raise is settlements. It's a purely political issue. There's, no, there's nothing intrinsically criminal about the Israelis living in the West Bank. It's a political issue. Who's the sovereign there? What's the territory and so on? Which will have to be solved by negotiations. But the ICC is treating this as a criminal offense. I, I, the, the preamble to the International Court talks about the crimes that uh, shock the, the conscience of humanity. And that, that's what they're talking about. Settlements is a difficult political issue. It doesn't shock the conscience of humanity if an Israeli goes and lives in the West Bank. It may be politically not wise, and in some, but that's not the issue. But for Israel, this has suddenly become a war crime. I think the reason they're doing it, they've been looking for a Western state to prosecute. They tried to prosecute US soldiers and, and British soldiers, and they dropped it like a hot potato. And they've been accused, so far you've only prosecuted Africans. So I, I suspect they were looking around for a Western state that is not a superpower. And they picked on Israel, and they're doing it for purely political, political reasons. But it's worrying. Mm -hmm. So if you had uh, an hour to spend with the, uh, I think it's Gabi Ashkenazi, the Minister of Foreign Affairs or whatever it is, uh, whoever it is at, at uh, this specific time, what would you tell him, uh, you know, regarding the international law issues on the table, whether it's to do with the ICC or the situation in Gaza? What's your advice, Mr. Councillor? My advice is defend yourself in international law because Israel's record is good. It's not perfect. No state has a perfect record, but Israel complies with international law. By the way, one of the reasons we do so is the Israeli courts enforce international law. And you may, may remember from your studies, the Bagats, the Israeli High Court of Justice, has ordered the government, the army, security service to, to do things which they don't want to do if it feels it's, under, it's complied with international law. Perhaps the best example is settlers private Palestinian land and build a settlement in the West Bank. The High Court of Justice ordered them to get out, and they did. There are not many countries in our area where the government would follow instructions of the High Court. Luckily, Israel, Israel is one of them. Yeah. So I would advise Ashkenazi, it, is, it still is Gabi Ashkenazi. I don't know what, who will be the foreign minister the next month, but it still is. <laughs> is uh, Israel's record is good. But it's got to be real international law. For instance, one 
wall of international law that has been invented for Israel is UN resolutions are binding. This is rubbish. The UN General Assembly resolutions are not binding. No state is on record as accepting the binding, except as regards Israel. And you may have seen uh, claims, Israel is violating UN resolutions. Rubbish, they're not binding, they're political statements. And since they're political statements, states vote for things that they know are absurd. I remember when I was in the, in the uh, as a junior delegate at, the, at, our, at the UN, and there was a ridiculous uh, proposal by Arab states. Israel goes around spreading AIDS and poisoning wells, and uh, European states would abstain at the best. And I remember saying, look, you know it's not true. And they said, of course, Mr. Sable, we know it's not true, but what do you care? It's not binding. And uh, in exchange, the Arab states will vote for our uh, proposals. They support our candidates. And uh, you get uh, Israel as being accused of everything by the UN General Assembly. But, but this doesn't stop it's people lawyers, journalists saying uh, Israel is violating UN resolutions. Why? For somehow, for Israel, they're considered to be binding, not for other states. Yeah, it's sui generis, like you call it, a special regime just for Israel. It's uh, unfair, if you will. Yeah. Not fair. Um, each unit in the army, as far as I know, has a legal advisor, attaché, or whatever you call it, that goes along with the combat units. And you're talking about the commander having to make these real-time decisions. Can, can you put yourself in the shoes of a, a legal advisor in the heat of war? Yes, their job is easier than that of a commander. By the way, it's, not, it's only at a fair, fairly high level. I think brigade, it doesn't go below brigade level. Okay. But at the brigade level, the legal advisor will say, you, Mr. Commander, artillery, I think, have to weigh. What are the uh, potential military advantages? against the potential civilian casualties. He'll then retire and leave the poor commander to make this decision. But because the, the, the legal advisor can't say how many civilian casualties you expect or what is a military advantage. Only the military commander may make it. And again, he has to worry about the safety of his own men, his own civilians, and he's often under fire. Mm -hmm. Not easy. Again, the Hamas don't have this problem. <laughs> they fire deliberately at civilians. Right. We do have this problem, as do other democratic states. And thankfully, we're going to continue to have this problem. Right. So you're, you're of the opinion, correct me if I'm wrong, that Israel should continue to engage and develop their international law and uh, engage with the international community, defend itself, not like some commentators have said, uh, disregard some aspects of international law just because they're blatantly biased. Uh, the reason I say this is Israel complies with what is real international law, not with UN resolutions. Uh -huh. When it comes to real, and by the way, most international law is basically common sense, decency, and Israel's record is terrific with that. Mm -hmm. But we have a problem with invented international law, things just tailor-made for Israel, which I talked about earlier. Here, we can disregard it. But on the other hand, by the way, we had a conference of judge advocate generals from Met, uh, I think about 30, 40 countries came to Israel for a conference. And we talked about fighting in Gaza. And they all said to, to us, your record is terrific. You've been doing, doing more than we can. So we said, well, why doesn't your government? Do then they said, well, politics. But the people who are in charge of military law in their own armies, you know, no army does, could, could do more than that to avoid civilian casualties. And as I said, we do it for moral reasons but also out of self-interest. It's not in our interest to cause civilian casualties. It doesn't advance our, our cause at all. It just, just helps the Hamas. Mm -hmm. But despite the opinion of the Jags, the friendly governments, I don't know about the Canadian government, but other friendly governments continue to condemn Israel. And it, it ain't fair. Right. That's right. Well, it should continue to be... Uh, you know, a stand-up a stand nation for the rest of the world, uh, leading the way in international law and morality for that matter. Um, I mean, uh, other countries have definitely learned and will continue to learn how Israel deals with their conflicts, uh, at least from an international law point of view, at least that. Uh, I want to ask you more generally speaking, you're, you're a great professor of mine, really inspirational, uh, bring, brought all sorts of personal anecdotes about your experiences. What type of advice would you give uh, 
lawyers, law students, um, maybe if they want to get into public international law or just in general, how to be the best lawyer they can be? <laughs> to be honest, my advice that a lawyer wants to earn a good living is international law is not the way to get wealthy. <laughs> right. So perhaps you're very sensible that you enjoy international law, Avi, but you're practicing real law. There's very few uh, avenues. You have to work either for the government or academia. There's a few lawyers who do some international law in private practice in Israel, right. not, and that's commercial law. But there's public international law, that is the relationship between states is uh, hardly dealt with by private lawyers. Nevertheless, I find it fascinating because there is international law, despite all these cynics, states, most states, most of the time comply with international law. And if you look at how the international relations are run in fields of maritime law and aviation law and trade and so on, most states, most of the time comply with it. So it works. It's a strange creature. There's no compulsory uh, courts. There's no international police force, but it does work. And therefore, I find I, anybody who has the foreign policy bug, which perhaps my wife thinks unhappily, I called at a young age, I would advise them to deal with international law, unless you want to be prosperous, in which case, choose, choose something else. Fair enough. And, and what makes a great lawyer? I mean, throughout your career, you've um, negotiated with some of the best. You've uh, you know, been been at the highest level of international law in the Israeli government, uh, even the world. You spent some time in New York. What what stands out as uh, an outstanding lawyer? Some someone that really uh, is a role model, if you will, uh, at least in in your life. I know you you're one of mine, and I try to interview my role models so I can learn from you. But I'm always curious what inspired you. Who inspired you? My advice might sound sound strange. Is Always speak the truth. Never deceive the opponent. You can get away with it. But once you've done that, you've lost your credibility. I assume this is true of your life as a private lawyer. Mm -hmm. In other words, you, and particularly diplomat, you don't have to tell the whole truth. But don't lie. And uh, it's so, so tempting sometimes just to sort of fudge things. You've lost your credibility uh, as a lawyer. Um, and... We were negotiating with the Palestinians in Washington. I remember uh, it was called the Madrid Talks. And we were negotiating, uh, trying to reach some sort of agreement. And we started off by t t going into the history and the Arabs accused us of uh, all the crimes of the Zionist movement. And we talked about their terrorism and their rejection of the partition plan and going on and on and on. And I remember an American senior diplomat called me in afterwards. I said, Bobby, why the hell don't you get down to business? And I explained to him, it's a form of catharsis. When, before you begin negotiating, you want to pray, pray, raise your position. You're not going to convince the other side. But something sinks in. After we, we were sitting there and hearing articulate Palestinians educated, explaining their problems. We, we, we disagreed with them, but I think something remained. And they were hearing Israelis, who I hope they saw as reasonable people, making arguments that we had a case in international law, that the Jewish people also had a right of self-determination. It didn't necessarily negate the fact that the Palestinians had, but they, they hadn't thought of that. They thought, oh, they're right, suddenly you know what, we are people, we have a right of self-determination. Uh, the mandate, which talked about a Jewish national home for the first time, was passed unanimously by the Council of the League of Nations. It represented world opinion, world legal opinion, that it was legal for the Jews to build a Jewish national home in Palestine. Again, it didn't mean the Palestinians could build it. So it's useful going through this, and the Americans couldn't understand it. They said, get down to business. Said, no, perhaps because they didn't understand the Middle Eastern uh, uh, attitude, you don't go straight gun to business, you talk about it. So we said session after session going through this, and I said, it must be done. <laughs> By the way, I remember one incident, we were looking to break the ice with the Palestinians, and uh, the first time they had, met, they had met with an official Israeli delegation, and for us, the first time we'd met with people who were PLO, they pretended not to be PLO, but they were clearly PLO. So we searched for a common factor. And the head of a delegation, Eli Rubenstein, said, you know what, 
the coffee here, American coffee, is awful. I don't know whether you've ever had American coffee, but they put it in a jug and they heat it the whole day and it became, it's absolutely awful. And the Palestinians said, yes, isn't it awful? And we all agreed upon that, agreed upon that, we found a common factor. By the way, there was no American in the room, but magically the next day they bought, that we found an espresso machine on the table. So apparently the Americans were aware of what was going on in the discussions. <laughs> that's hilarious. They, they hear everything. That's, that's incredible. Can you give us another few anecdotes before we let you go about, uh, you know, your, your career and experience? Uh, we've covered a lot, but uh, I don't want to let you go without hearing one or two more stories about maybe negotiations. What in your mind tanked the negotiations? What in your mind was perhaps a successful negotiation? Give us a couple more anecdotes before we let you go. Uh, I think uh, I took part uh, in the Egypt-Israel uh, negotiation. I think they were very successful. One thing that we try to teach our political uh, superiors is drafting is done by using international legal terms and they have legal significance. Uh, you know this from private law. If you say something must be done in a reasonable time, I'm sure there's some Canadian Supreme Court decision that says reasonable time does include Sunday or does include Sunday or something. But only a lawyer would know that. And the same is true of international law. I remember one case uh, at, one, at the late stage of the negotiation, to Egypt agreed to send, have an ambassador to Israel and accept an Israeli ambassador, diplomatic relations. This was a tremendous breakthrough. And it was achieved by personal contact between uh, Moshe Dayan, who was the foreign minister at the time, and uh, uh, President Jimmy Carter. And I looked at the, at the dog and they said there'll be exchange of ambassadors. So I went in to see Moshe Dayan, who was, not, who was a very bright man, but not a very pleasant man. I said, uh, Mr. Minister, there's a problem here. Because under international law, you can have a non-resident ambassador. It's perfectly legal. And he turned to me, he said, Robbie, go to hell. I'm not going to go back to the President of the United States and go into the question where he's going to live, the ambassador. I don't care about it. He sent me out of the room. Uh -huh. Luckily for me, he consulted with our Attorney General, later he must have thought about Barak, who said, you know, Robbie's correct. Under international law, you can send a non-resident ambassador. Uh, so, Dayan had to go back to the President of the United States and say, please add the word resident ambassador. He didn't like doing it. We learned afterwards that's exactly what the Egyptians had intended. That appoint their ambassador, I think it was in Rome, to be ambassador in Israel, and they would have fulfilled the thing. So, when you're, draft the only, uh, when you're drafting a document, you're drafting a legal document that would be interpreted by international lawyers. Another, Save the day. another example I remember was when we were negotiating with Jordan, I, I negotiated the water issue with Jordan. Uh, Jordan said, okay, we want to have an equitable share of the waters of the Jordan River. And the head, our political head of delegation said, well, that's fine. Equity is fair. And they agreed to it. And it was the job of the lawyer to say, hey, it's a technical term. It means the whole water course should be shared according to needs and other factors. The whole water course includes the Lake of Galilee, the Upper Jordan. Sir, uh, I didn't actually call him sir, so I, but I said, do you really intend to give the King of Jordan, the Fenny Jordan, a half share in the whole of the Cal Lake of Galilee? And, no. uh -huh. So we went back and look at the treaty with Jordan, it talks about how much water we're going to give them. I said, that's not a legal decision. You can decide to give them 100 or 500. But a certain quantity of water. But if you say an equitable share, it means they can come demand half, or maybe more, because their their need is greater than ours. Yeah. So you need the international lawyer as a drafter. In the same way that you don't do a will without getting a lawyer involved, a wise statesman doesn't have a treaty. Doesn't get involved in a treaty unless it's being drafted by his his lawyer. Well, wow, that's really right. You don't often think about the massive implications of not having a lawyer in the international arena, but you've just given some examples about how lawyers can really come through and save the day and change the landscape of things, literally, one, one way or another. You've had some great uh, experiences there negotiating and being part of the history of Israel. Now, the precedents are useful. They're not binding. But if you can bring a precedent and say, look, this has been done already, it makes it much, much easier. Again, my personal experience, we were negotiating with the, uh, Jordan, 
Mm. It was after the peace treaty with Egypt. They simply took blocks of the peace treaty with Egypt and copied it into the peace treaty with Jordan. Why? It made it much easier for Jordan, a small country, to say, well, Egypt did it. Mm -hmm. And it's the lawyer who knows the precedence. If you, uh, you can quote from a uh, UN, we, for instance, with Egypt, we quoted from UN resolutions that we, kn we knew Egypt had accepted and we had accepted. Mm -hmm. Resolution 242. So it's, it's plagiarism, but sometimes it's a lawyer and international law do plagiarism because Egypt said, oh, that's okay, we accepted it. In the past, they knew their government had. And this is the job of the lawyer to provide the, the useful precedent and put it in the right spot. Yeah. Um, you think those so, precedents could be used going forward as well in uh, is Israel-Palestinian conflict? I know those are neighboring states, but nonetheless, certain things, do you think they could be applied for peace going forward? We search for it. It's difficult to find a precedent for the very difficult Palestinian-Israeli situation. There's mm -hmm. two people living in the same land, uh, and it's very difficult. We, we talked about autonomy, and, and there was uh, there are a number of precedents for autonomy. But autonomy is is your part, an autonomous part of a state. You could say that Quebec is in a fairly semi-autonomous part of Canada or Greenland part of Denmark, but they don't want to be an autonomous part of Israel. So it's not really autonomy. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there's certain issues that are for fighting. We can't have a military forces. Uh, on, our, on, on the western side of the River Jordan, something we can't live with. We've got to com combat terrorism. So uh, I'm not sure how much precedence can help, but we will need international lawyers because, as I said earlier, at the end of the discussions, there'll be an agreement, and the agreement will be interpreted by lawyers, and the language they use will be legal, legal language. So I don't think they can get away without, get away without using international lawyers. Robbie, I must say that you've had a great impact on the state of Israel, on many, many students, including myself. You continue to teach and be an inspiration to many. And I hope that your experience leads to some better things in the Israeli government. Use your experience, your precedence, if you will, to achieve uh, more peace and stability in the region and uh, continue doing what you're doing. It's, it's really inspirational and, and great for the rest of us who learn from you. Avi, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it, and uh, hopefully we can do it again soon. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye for now.